Today's video is sponsored by Stamps.com. I know from personal experience how time-consuming shipping can be. After sending out some lazy plushies to my biggest supporters, I've come to realise it can be a long and costly process. Stamps.com understands that. For the past 25 years, they've helped over 1 million businesses like yours save time, money and stress. Stamps.com lets you print your own postage and shipping labels in seconds, from wherever you do business. All you need is a computer and a printer. They even send you a free scale, so you'll have everything you need to get started. And if you need a package pickup, you can easily schedule one through the Stamps.com dashboard. Running a business isn't cheap, so my favourite thing about using Stamps.com are the huge carrier discounts. We're talking up to 84% off UPS and USPS rates. Plus, Stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options, so you know you're always getting the best deal. Stamps.com gets you access to the USPS and UPS services you need from your computer, anytime, day or night, without the need to visit the post office. And if you sell products online, Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Sign up at Stamps.com forward slash Lazy Masquerade for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts, just hassle-free postage on demand. That's stamps.com forward slash lazy masquerade, or click the link in my description and set your business up for success today. The late 2000s, a time where everyone found themselves delving into the creepy side of YouTube, sometimes accidentally, oftentimes intentionally. An era where cursed videos and images reign supreme. The more ominous and unexplained, the better. I feel fantastic. There is nothing. Shay St. John. And this. Though not as well known as some other eerie artifacts from that period, there's a good chance you recognise it. The White House GIF. Or GIF if you're a sociopath. It appeared in a plethora of online spaces back in the day in creepypastas and YTPs, on social media platforms and image boards, and shared around between friends as a sort of dark joke. Though, undoubtedly, it's most strongly associated with one piece of content in particular. A video uploaded to YouTube on November 29th, 2008. Why you never became a dancer. Since then, the videos acquired nearly 4 million views and earn this unsettling clip a place in the internet's dark hall of fame. And yet, despite being so recognisable, the identity of the woman who appears in the White House GIF remained a mystery for years. In order to finally identify her, an internet-wide search was conducted by people across the globe, all of them searching for the source image used to create the GIF, much like how people are searching for the original Jeff the Killer picture today. But unlike old Jeffy Boy, the unedited photo behind the White House GIF has since been uncovered, and the truth behind it turned out to be much darker than anyone anticipated. But to explain why, we'll need some backstory. Some of you may be familiar with the name Tracy Emin. She's an acclaimed British artist, famous for the confessional nature of her work. In 1995, when her career was still in its infancy, she released a six-minute short film titled Why I Never Became a Dancer. It's a simple piece, featuring various shots of Margate, the seaside town where Emin grew up. Over these home movie-esque images, Emin tells the harrowing story of her youth, about how she left school at the age of 13 and began having frequent relations with much older men, something which didn't seem wrong to her at the time. As she aged though, she came to understand the horrors of what had actually happened to her, and eventually found solace through the medium of dance, something which she was naturally talented at. The film ends with Emin telling the story of the local dance finals which she participated in, a competition which she saw as her ticket out of Margate, a chance for her to move to a prestigious academy in London and jumpstart her career. She explains how her routine was going well, that is until it was interrupted by a group of older men in the crowd. Men with whom she had had relations in the past. They repeatedly yelled, Ooh, from the stands, ruining her big opportunity and prompting her to run from the auditorium in embarrassment. 
the film concludes with Emin saying, Shane, Eddie, Tony, Doug, Richard, this one's for you, before cutting to a clip of her dancing to Sylvester's You Make Me Feel. It was an act of defiance, but not everyone saw it that way. Amongst them, the members of White House. Also hailing from England, White House were a power electronics band who worked within the genre of noise music, and were well known for their intense, some might say unscrupulous, lyrics, as well as their heavily distorted sound. White House had taken notice of Emin Shortville, and, eight years later, made a response track. A song titled, Why You Never Became a Dancer. The song aggressively accuses Emin of making up the entire story she told in her short film, saying that she lied about her past hurt for personal gain. It's unclear why White House was so certain that Emin was lying, though the group's stance on the issue may have changed in recent years, given that they've asked certain websites to remove the song's lyrics from their archives, and seem to have taken the song down from their own official platforms. But that doesn't mean that the song's inaccessible. If you type Why You Never Became a Dancer into YouTube right now, you'll be met with this fan-made music video, posted by user Acid Blood Infusion, in which the titular track plays over the White House gif, a looped animation of a woman whose face has been heavily distorted. Her eyes and mouth move in an unnerving manner, and the image just feels off in a way that's hard to articulate. Some say that the face reminds them of a sleep paralysis demon, or an eldritch ghost that haunts the internet, though a minority actually seem to find it quite comical. Whatever your opinion, you have to agree that this visual just seems totally out of place here. I mean, this isn't the face of Tracy Emin, nor of anyone affiliated with the band White House, and the animation seemingly has nothing to do with the song or its lyrics. That incongruity made the gif all the more mysterious and memorable. But it also left people scratching their heads, and prompted them to ask some questions. Firstly, why had the uploader specifically selected this GIF as the background for the video? Secondly, and more importantly, where was the source image used to create it? An original must exist somewhere online after all, and many were curious what this woman actually looked like in real life. Well, let's clear the GIF up a little bit, and work backwards from there. That's better. Now, since the woman's face has an unreal, almost ghost-like quality to it, some people speculated that the gif had been created from scratch. But to be clear, that's not the case. This animation had been made using a real photo as its basis, one which had been processed through some rudimentary program. Throughout the mid-2000s, internet users were beginning to experiment with image manipulation software, which at the time could be used to create visuals like this. The original deepfakes, though perhaps shallow fakes is more accurate. As you can see, the results often gave their subjects an uncanny aesthetic, similar to that of the White House lady. Her gift must have been made using one of these programs, one that was available in late 2008. Well, there aren't many contenders, and Twitter user Aeroburger recently made a post suggesting that it was probably crazy talk, a piece of software that dates back to December 2003 and which could turn photos into talking avatars. By today's standards, quite primitive, but it was a fun novelty for many when times were simpler. The 2003 version of Crazy Talk only came with lip-syncing features, but later versions included more dynamic head motion capabilities. Here's an example from June 2009, uploaded to YouTube five months after the White House GIF first appeared online. If we look at them side by side, the janky movements, eye blinks, mouth movements and head motion all seem to match up nicely. Though it's not yet clear whether this exact version of Crazy Talk was available in November 2008, I think we can say that Aeroburger is definitely onto something here. Since the White House GIF was confirmed to have been made using a real photo, web sleuths turned their attention to tracking down the source image. People had long been questioning the woman's true identity with the prevailing theory being that she was of Native American descent. Her features, and especially this headdress, seemed to suggest that was the case. With that in mind, 
internet detectives scoured through old US TV shows, newspaper articles, and high school yearbooks, hoping to catch a glimpse of someone who bore a resemblance to the White House woman. But no dice. Reverse image searches turned up nothing. Foraging through old black and white media proved fruitless. For more than a decade, people dove into the darkest corners of the internet, looking for evidence of this woman's existence. And time and time again, came up empty-handed. And the reason for that was simple. They were looking in the wrong places. And in the wrong language. As well as crazy talk, there was potentially another program that may have processed the GIF. In 2007, a Japanese company called Motion Portrait Limited began pioneering facial animation technology for the masses. In the years that followed, they released a series of photo manipulation apps like Zombie Booth and Hige Booth, many of which garnered tens of millions of downloads. And their first app just so happened to be released around the same time that Acid uploaded this video. Could have been a coincidence. But the prospect of the GIF being Japanese in origin got people looking further afield for clues. One of those people was Reddit user Lane Campbell, 77. On June 15th of this year, Lane stumbled upon the Subaru, a Japanese website revolving around urban legends and online mysteries. There, they found a blog post made by the site's owner. There are many spooky GIFs on the net, wrote the Subaru. And among them is this. It's a gif of a girl with a round face, moving her head while smiling. Some movements are unnatural, and I feel uneasy just looking at it. This image seems to be popular mainly overseas, but in Japan, it's often posted on scary image threads. You may have seen it before. I was curious about the details of this image, so I looked it up. But even after attempting an image search, I couldn't find much. I've checked other comments too, but unfortunately, I haven't been able to find any further information. The Subaru continued searching the internet in hopes of finding the original image, when, one day, a random Twitter follower sent them this picture. A grainy photo of a smiling girl. This is unquestionably the White House GIF's unedited source image. As Subaru points out, all of the elements line up perfectly. What some viewers initially thought was a headdress was actually part of the background that wasn't keyed out. So now that we have the original photo, it seems natural to ask, who exactly is this woman? Well, we actually have an answer for that too. Though unfortunately, it's not a question of who she is, but rather, who she was. I found the full pic, wrote Lane. The photo's from a book about the Japanese serial killer, Kiyoshi Okubo. The girl's name is Reiko Takemura, and she was one of the eight victims of his crimes. She was 21. It's still a mystery what book this was taken from. As it turns out, the girl we've all been searching for, Reiko Takemura, wasn't a TV personality or an interviewee from a news broadcast. She was a murder victim, and the photo used to make this gif had been taken from a report on her slaying. Though not the first to link Reiko to the White House gif, Lane Campbell's post has brought this revelation to the wider internet's attention. Lane's post continued. With this new image, it opened up a lot of new pathways for research. I came across a video about the incident. And once again, watching through it, we can come across another sighting. It flashes at timestamp 1051. This version of the image, taken from an old Japanese TV spot, is much cleaner than any other we've found to date, and is currently the first known appearance of the photo in the media. This TV segment tells the story of Kiyoshi Okubo, one of Japan's most notorious deviants and the man responsible for ending Reiko's life. Born in 1935, Kiyoshi showed signs of being unhinged from a very early age. He was relentlessly teased at school for his Western appearance, the result of him being a quarter Russian, 
and would often take his frustrations out on his female classmates, saying and doing extremely inappropriate things to them. Those who knew his family half joked that Kiyoshi was, quote, the son of Kodaira, an infamous serial slayer from Tokyo. Those comments would turn out to be eerily prophetic. As Kiyoshi got older, his behavior became more and more demented. He was in and out of prison for much of his young adulthood, with convictions for blackmail and with one incident landing him a four and a half year sentence. He was paroled from prison on March 2nd, 1971, and almost immediately upon his release, bought himself a high-end Mazda Familiar Rotary Coupe M10A. Whilst locked up behind bars, Kiyoshi had been stewing in his resentment for society, and he had decided to take out his frustrations on his home prefecture of Gunma. His new car was to play a big role in his twisted plan. Between March 31st and May 10th of that year, Kiyoshi donned a berry and Russian-style outwear and drove around the exits of Gumma's busiest stations, calling out to women from his luxury vehicle, pretending to be a successful painter who had just returned home from France. I have a workshop in the area, he would tell them. I want you to model for me. With that offer, he'd motion for them to get into his car with a s'il vous plaît. Over the course of those 41 days, he accosted at least 127 women. Around 30 of them got inside his car. More than a dozen of them were and eight of them were slain. They were Miyako Suda, 17, a student. Mieko Oikawa, 17, a waitress. Chieko Ida, 19, a government employee. Seiko Kawabata, 17, a student. Akemisato, 17, a student. Kazuyo Kawaho, 18, a telephone operator. Naoko Takahashi, 21, a housemaid. And, of course, Deiko Takemura, 21, a company employee from Fujioka City. Kiyoshi later described Reiko's final evening to detectives. I asked Reiko to be a model for my paintings, led her in my car, and drove her to Isesaki. We talked about coffee shops, western literature, and mountaineering. The conversation was lively, and I thought that she had come to like me. So we left the cafe, and took a drive. I tried to take her to a motel, but she refused, saying, do I look like that kind of girl? Later, along a forest road, I tried forcing myself upon her, but she slapped me and said, Stop! My father's a policeman! She tried to run. I stopped her, her, and strangled her. Unfortunately for Reiko, she had uttered the word that Kiyoshi hated to hear more than any other. A word which turned him into a feral creature. Police. In interviews with Kiyoshi, he later admitted to investigators that Reiko and the seven other victims he killed had all used that word to try and scare him off, and that's why he chose to end their lives specifically. Reiko had lied about her father being in law enforcement in a bid to save her own life, but in a cruel twist of fate, it ended up having the opposite effect. I was stupid not to see through her lie, Kiyoshi later said. When asked why the word made him snap, he replied, I hate women, and I hate the police. I hate women because they've framed me in the past. I hate the police because they always listen to the plaintiff and never listen to my explanation. I was betrayed by women, betrayed by society, and pushed into the depths of despair. So I gave up my human blood and decided to become a cold-blooded animal. In the end, Kiyoshi was brought to justice thanks to the efforts of Reiko's own brother, Mitsuo. After his sister disappeared, Mitsuo stayed up all night searching for her. In the early hours, he came upon Reiko's bike by the gates of a credit union. But rather than run up to inspect it, he instead held back and simply observed it from a distance. After waiting for some time, 
he saw a stranger approach the bicycle. It was Kiyoshi, Okubo. He had returned to wipe down the bike and remove any fingerprints he may have left behind. Mitsuo cautiously stepped out from the shadows and simply asked, Was it you? Startled, Kiyoshi replied, Oh, no. It's a nice bike. I was just wondering what it's doing in a place like this. Kiyoshi smiled awkwardly, and then ran to his vehicle and drove off. Unbeknownst to Mitsuo, Kiyoshi would go on to take the life of another girl that very same day. But unbeknownst to Kiyoshi, Mitsuo had just taken note of his license plate. Even with his plates and a description of his face, investigators still couldn't locate Kiyoshi. As such, Mitsuo took matters into his own hands and set up a private search party consisting of friends, family members, and employees from his own company. He vowed to not eat again until he found the culprit behind his sister's disappearance. On May 14th, members of his search party finally located Kiyoshi. He was driving his car through Gumma. At the time, a female high school student was sat in the passenger's seat. A lucky escape for her. The search party held Kiyoshi until the authorities arrived. At the station, Kiyoshi gave a full confession and eventually led detectives to where he had buried Reiko, in the shadow of Mount Miyogi. The authorities had him draw up a map of where to find the other seven victims. They were worried that a mob would butcher him if he appeared there in person again. Once news of his modus operandi spread, master sales in Gunma Prefecture dropped significantly. Even today, Gunma is master's worst performing prefecture by sales. Kiyoshi Okubo was hanged on January 22nd, 1976, six days after his 41st birthday. These are the last images ever captured of him, filmed on the same day he met his fate. It's said that he was so scared he couldn't even walk that day. When asked if he had any last comments to make, he stated, If I could be reborn, I would like to come back as a weed. I was told by a woman I once knew that no matter how much they get tread upon, they always snap back. That's the kind of existence I'd like to have in the next life. And so it becomes clear why Acid, the original uploader of this viral video, chose to use such a seemingly random gif. The White House track accuses Tracy Emin of lying about, and Reiko succumbed to such a fate. The parallels are clear. Whether this was some form of commentary, a joke in poor taste, or a genuine coincidence is anyone's guess. Regardless, Kiyoshi Okubo's story was heavily publicized in Japan, which begs the question, why did it take so long to uncover the source image behind the White House gif? Well, as is often the case with these Japanese stories, images of the victims are hard to come by. Due to strict privacy laws, most news articles in the country keep their faces and even their names secret. For example, in the majority of articles I found, Reiko is typically referred to as G-san. It obviously also goes without saying that the majority of information about Reiko's case is written in Japanese, making the search nigh impossible for most online detectives. Though thanks to the page that Lane Campbell shared, we now have the answers we need. But let's not stop there. In Lane Campbell's post, they said that it's still a mystery what book this photo appears in. Well, I'm happy to report that that's no longer the case. After hours of digging, I've managed to track it down online. It's actually a two-page fold from a magazine, Jitsuroku Sengo Tabu Hanzaishi, or Post-War Taboo Crime History, published by Core Magazine Limited, a company with a less than stellar reputation, let's put it like that. They've been taken to court numerous times for criminal infractions of their own, not least for accidentally publishing. And such carelessness makes me wonder about this photo of Reiko. Even in its unedited form, it still looks a little off, don't you think? Especially when you see it alongside the more natural looking photos of the other victims. Take a look at all of these images used in the magazine. They're the exact same ones used in the TV segment that Lane unearthed. 
there are several photos available for at least some of the victims, so it seems strange to me that the magazine made use of the exact same pictures as the TV show for all of them. Given their past history, I personally wouldn't be surprised if Core Magazine simply ripped these photos from the show without much thought. Focusing on this photo of Reiko, as far as we know, this unknown television spot and this page from Core Magazine are the only two places that it's ever appeared. Which makes me wonder, this super contrasted, undetailed photo, is it really of Reiko? I mentioned that Japan has strict privacy laws. Well, TV shows in the country often make use of example images to avoid legal issues. I can't help but wonder whether the TV company couldn't get permission from Reiko's family to use her image, or simply couldn't acquire a picture of her for whatever reason, and so made use of a placeholder image. One of a fake person. Well, that's all speculation on my part. But even if this really is Reiko, surely there are better photos out there that we can replace this with. Ones that would do Reiko's memory more justice. She deserves that much at least. So, let's find one. Tracking down and translating Japanese media sources can be tricky, but thankfully we have an invaluable asset on our side. My wife, Lady Masquerade. With her help, I've managed to unearth a clip from an old news broadcast made by the Janichi Film Company, one that features a report on Reiko's slaying and real footage from her memorial service. And there we have it, the face of Reiko Takemura, or at least a more detailed photo of her face. This broadcast also includes interviews with both her brother, Mitsuo, and her mother, who tells us a lot about who her daughter was in life. Reiko was a vivacious young woman who did a lot of things with the short time she had. She was passionate about skiing, and was also an avid tennis player. She loved socialising, had plenty of friends, and, according to those closest to her, made everyone laugh constantly. She was an extremely determined person, who set goals for herself and went for them. Her future was as bright as her infectious smile, and it was cruelly snatched away from her. With any luck, we'll be able to find more photos of Reiko in the near future. Some people have been sharing this image around, claiming it shows the faces of Kiyoshi's eight victims, but these are actually actresses from a teledrama based on the slangs. There definitely are better quality photos of Reiko that exist though. Take a look at this old magazine pullout from 1971. It shows the faces of all eight slain women alongside Kiyoshi. By process of elimination, I'm 95% confident that Reiko is this woman right here. I also know for a fact there's another one of her in this book. On this preview, you can see that there's a page with all eight victims' faces, but it's too blurry to make them out, and the only copy I can find for sale costs almost a thousand dollars US. If I find any more reasonably priced copies, or come across some more photos of Reiko, I'll update you all on my Twitter page. Now, the final question left to answer is perhaps the trickiest of them all. Namely, who actually made the White House GIF? In the words of the Subaru, I'm curious as to who manipulated a victim's photo in such a way, but the author of the GIF remains unknown. The obvious answer is that it was the person who posted the dancer video in the first place, Acid Blood Infusion. But although he popularised the GIF, I personally don't think he was responsible for its creation. Looking through his channel, it seems he only ever posted clips and images already available on the web. Another of his White House fan videos, for example, is just a looped clip of Professor Utonium. The only way he ever manipulated his videos was by applying filters to them. There's no original animation in any of his other content. So although Acid's video appears to be where the White House gif made its debut, I think it's more likely he found it online somewhere, 
likely while browsing an obscure Japanese forum. As we've come to learn, this photo of Reiko is an extremely deep cut, so whoever the true author of this gif is, they made it knowing full well what happened to her. And the fact someone would do such a thing is far scarier than the gif itself. As one Japanese commenter put it, it's like digging up graves and playing with corpses. Reiko Takemura had her life taken away from her, and then, decades later, was victimized yet again, this time by having her face processed and turned into content. Content that's been laughed or screamed at by millions of people around the world, none of them aware of who she was or what happened to her. I thought it was important to share Reiko's story with you for that very reason, to potentially undo a small amount of the damage caused to her and her family by this gif. A gif which is no longer scary, or funny, or entertaining. Just sad. GR John Hughes George Lopez Alex Greensaw Asia Mina Asriel Warakai, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Dupsy, Gina Valera, Ian Billock, Infamous Sempapi, Leonardo Martinez, Peter Logjurich, Taylor and Monica Gruenk, Dustin and Tiffany Vanderpool, Verily Verdant, Hamish, TNS Mum, Brad Hammer 33, Mrs. Avon Rankin, Hamish K, Wise Enderman of the Soil, Ellen Doloff, Itai Allon, Zombie Pumpkin, Holly Leons, Lydia Kuma, and Nevis 1988. Thank you all so much for your continued support. Until next time, The Devils in the Detail.